So next up, we have Sarah Gerke, and she's an assistant professor of law at Penn State Dickinson Law. Uh, her research focuses on the ethical and legal challenges of artificial intelligence and big data for healthcare and health law in the U.S. and Europe. Before joining Penn State uh, Dickinson Law, Professor Gerke served as a research fellow in medicine, artificial intelligence, and law at the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School with a project on precision medicine, artificial intelligence, and the law known as PMAIL. Thanks. Thank you, Anya, for this kind introduction, and thank you uh, for having me uh, um, and organizing this conference. Uh, so today I will talk a little bit about um, issues of data sharing in the world of medical AI. In a second, I will show you what I'm going to talk about. So I will talk briefly about, um, about the current applications of medical AI, and then we'll focus on some of the issues of data sharing by fo focusing um, and looking at the Health Insurance Credibility and Accountability Act, HIPAA, the Federal Trade Commission Act, the FTC Act, and then the EU General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR. Uh, so let's start with some of the current applications of medical AI. So um, AI is rapidly entering health care and, and may fundamentally change the way physicians ma uh, practice medicine in the future. And the FDA has already permitted over 340 AI-based medical devices. So this is an example of an autonomous AI, it's called IDXDR, and can detect more than a mild level of diabetic retinopathy in diabetic patients. Also, there's a considerable uh, amount and increase in direct-to-consumer uh, health AI applications. So for example, this is ADA. ADA is an AI symptom checker. And once you download ADA, you need to uh, fill in uh, and, and uh, answer some questions and about your symptoms. And then uh, the app will suggest conditions and offer advice. And you can also use ADA uh, for monitor changes in one's health. And so um, despite the potential of AI to improve healthcare, it also raised a couple of ethical and legal issues, one of which is to adequately protect the privacy of individuals. And so AI is depending on a lot of data yeah, to really work. And so the use and disclosure of sensitive data, like health data, may compromise consumers' privacy. And so in the US, we have the Health Insurance, um, Accountability, um, health insurance Credibility and Accountability Act, so-called HIPAA, to, uh, which is kind of the key federal law to protect health, um, certain health information. And so, the, but there is an issue with HIPAA um, in, in the current um, healthcare environment because HIPAA only covers so-called protected health information generated by HIPAA-covered entities or their business associates. So what does that mean? The protected health information is usually individually identifiable health information. And HIPAA-covered entities are health plans, health care uh, clearing houses, and then also uh, health care providers who transmit health information electronically in connection with particular transactions. And a business associate is usually a person or entity that performs certain functions or activities on behalf of or provides services to a covered entity that involves the use or disclosure of protected health information. And so what does that mean? It means that Usually, HIPAA does not cover health information generated by entities not covered by HIPAA. And so much of the health information collected by tech companies like Google, Microsoft, Apple, et cetera, are usually not covered entities. And so will fall outside of HIPAA. And so all the health information collected by them can usually be used and shared without HIPAA's restrictions. And a different problem of HIPAA is the so-called um, de-identification, the reliance of de-identification as a privacy strategy. So when, for example, hospitals share data with Google and Co., they often make sure that the data is de-identified. And that means that de-identified health information can usually be shared freely uh, for research and commercial purposes without any restrictions. And de-identification is usually being done by the removal of 18 identifiers, such as names, um, social security numbers, biometric identifiers of the individual or the related household members or employers of the individual. And then the covered entity um, also does not have actual knowledge that the information could be used to identify the individual. Um, and so 
um, the problem is also that um, HIPAA may not adequately protect the privacy of patients because of the so-called data triangulation. So what does that mean? A person may be de-identified as to one data set, but the data may be easily re-identified through the combination of another available data set. Let's shift for a little bit the focus and look at the FTC Act, the Federal Trade Commission Act. So the Federal Trade Commission is responsible for the protection of American consumers. And in particular, Section 5A of the FTC Act declares unlawful, unfair methods of competition in or affecting commerce and unfair deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce. And the commission is empowered and directed to prevent persons, partnerships, or corporations from using unfair methods of competition in or affecting commerce and unfair deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce. So what's interesting that especially these days, the FTC has particular interest in health app developers to ensure that they deliver on their promises to consumers about the responsible use of their health information. So for example, in the last year's complaint, the FTC actually alleged to health um, uh, that they violated Section 5A of the FTC Act. So Flow Health offers an AI app that is a, a period of ovulation tracker that aims to help pregnancy in pregnancy and childbirth. And what happened is apparently Flow Health shared the information of over 100 million consumers about menstruation, um, information over um, all the, of their consumers about menstruation and gynecological health collected through the app with third parties such as Facebook and Google. And uh, against the promise to keep this information secret. And so um, once that came out, um, uh, the FTC, um, but, so at the end of the day, what happened is Flow House and the FTC settled. And in a finalized order, the FTC required Flow House to obtain express consent from their consumers before sharing personal data with companies like Google. And that's kind of like also in contrast to the GDPR, which we have in, U uh, in the EU, which has implemented a much more comprehensive regulatory data protection framework. And so the GDPR has been applied since 25th May 2018 in all EU member states and really introduced a new era of data protection in the EU. And it protects fundamental rights and freedoms of natural persons, and in particular, their right to protection of personal data. Uh, the GDPR is also a lot broader in its material scope than the US HIPAA and applies to all personal data, including data concerning health. And it also has a very wide territorial scope. So that means that even uh, US companies might, under specific circumstances, fall under this exception. Uh, inspired by the GDPR, some states in the US have now also recently enacted uh, comprehensive privacy legislations such as uh, Virginia um, and California um, as, as examples. And then, because I'm running out of time, just, just one more thought is cross-border transfer of personal data, which is very interesting because recently it has been very difficult. And that's because of a decision, the so-called Champ 2 um, judgment from the Court of Justice of the EU, which struck down the so-called privacy shield. And that was a framework that had provided the possibility of lawful transfers from Europe to the US. And so um, that happened because the court uh, is, was of the opinion that the US does not provide an adequate level of protection for personal data transfer uh, from Europe to the US. And so these days it's very difficult to actually do cross-border transfers, but there is some hope because recently um, the European Commission and the US um, uh, announced like, that there should be or maybe a new framework um, which will be implemented in the future. I stop here um, and thank you for having me.